I'm investigative reporter Jace Larson. What you're looking at behind me there are cages over top of real human bodies. Those bodies are at a body farm and they're decomposing so scientists can study how that process works. Let me tell you, in this story, you're going to see some images that might be graphic, actual human bodies. But before you change the channel, let me tell you how important this is to science and how it is helping families who have a missing loved one who's been lost get some closure. We're going out to what we're calling the uh, Outdoor Research Facility, and it's named after Adam Kennedy, who was one of our first donors, and so it's the Adam Kennedy Forensic Field. I think we'll just walk in from here. So this is three and a half acres. It's, as you can see, for the most part, uh, open. Up in this area, we have remains out on the surface. Um, the cages help keep the carnivores and vultures away. We've done a number of burials, including a mass burial up here, and individual burials back here, which will be used for trainings next year. What's the most recent body that you have out here? Uh, let's go look. I think it was about a month ago. What you're looking at is an individual who's already gone through all the stages of decomposition where the tissues um, bloat and, and then recede and they change color and, and a lot of the soft tissue is lost. So it's something that would be like a very advanced stage of decomposition, but it's not fully skeletonized yet. The skull is because the skull and hands and feet will often skeletonize first, um, but you'll see in the torso and areas where there's more tissue to start with, that will take longer. Looking at this, it's a little unnerving to see. Tell us why this is so important. Well, it's really important because when investigators go to a crime scene, one of the first questions, of course, is who is this victim? And then how long have they been here? When those two questions are answered, it can lead police to a perpetrator or somebody responsible for that person's death. But without those answered, it can often remain open or become a cold case. So. Having a facility like this where we can put together that really strong timeline for Florida because of our temperature, um, the amount of water we get, the particular scavengers, birds, and animals that we have, um, helps us be more accurate in, the, in figuring out who they are, how long they've been dead, um, maybe even finding the grave itself as sometimes they're hidden and we have to search for them. We got this call in 1993, a hiker who wanted to not start on the trail to Gregory Canyon. As he was hiking up, he discovered what he thought was a deer, uh, the carcass of a deer, and he approached it to about within five feet and quickly realized that it was actually human remains. This gentleman was found in a, an area of brush that's down below us. Um, he was found with his head facing downward on the slope and because we aren't able to determine exactly what caused this man to die or how, uh, we are ruling this the undetermined manner. So we are doing an updated anthropological exam on him as our past one in 1993 indicated that this gentleman was probably between the ages of 25 to 32 and between 5'3 and 5'6 in height, our updated report can give us a better estimation. Uh, both of them um, are long, what we call long-term unidentified remains. Um, they've been, they were found, uh, for the most part, skeletonized um, hikers, uh, separate incidences, they're not linked together, and uh, attempts to identify them over the years have just gone cold. We've been unable to figure out who they are, and so they've come to us for a couple of reasons, um, a facial reconstruction to help put that face out to the public, hopefully it triggers memory, um, somebody will come forward, and to do something called chemical isotope testing. And it's a way of looking at bone, teeth, um, hair, and trying to determine whether someone comes from the area in which they died. 
So the question would be, are these two men local to Colorado, or maybe did they come to Colorado from some other location? Uh, it looks like both of them were there for a good uh, amount of time uh, before they died. You can tell where they were born and if they are from the Colorado area. Mm -hmm. uh, chemical isotopes is a really cool technique. It's not new in terms of science, but it's new to forensics and using it in this way to try and basically track where people come from. So it gives broad geographical locations. It's not like we can name a city or even a specific state, but more a region. And the concept is, uh, if you've ever heard, you are what you eat. So basically the elements that end up in your food and water remain in your teeth and bone structures. So those structures develop in your body at different times, and as they develop um, and are retained there, it gives us like a timeline of someone's life um, from early childhood to the last five to seven years before they died. And if we're looking at hair, it could be the months or years before they died. The individual was uh, a white or had European ancestry, was a little bit older, maybe 30 to uh, 45 years of age. We're at 4,500 feet above mean sea level, and that changes the solar radiation, it changes uh, atmospheric pressure. In addition, we're the only one in a truly arid environment. In our elevation and in our drier, bodies tend to naturally desiccate or mummify. In fact, there are prehistoric mummies that have been found that just naturally desiccated. So we have this whole different trajectory or path that decomposition will take naturally. As opposed to Florida, where generally they'll skeletonize fairly quickly. And part of that difference is in these little scavengers called maggots. The maggots tend to proliferate, fly eggs, turn into maggots. They'll eat tissue that isn't too desiccated, it isn't too hard. And so those remains will often skeletonize very quickly. Our remains, they tend to um, mummify very quickly, get beyond the point that flies or um, maggots can digest the remains, and so they're very stable for a long period of time. What we're looking at with Cornell is the different blowfly species. They have a confined region in which they live, and so there hasn't been a lot of research on how they develop, and that schedule of development can be used to get a clearer picture of when a person has died. The most important thing is try and figure out who they were so the remains can be returned to the family. Um, we have this strong belief that uh, every, for every missing person there's a family missing them and over and over as we've been able to identify cases um, that's what we find is that there's someone out there who'd been searching and that's really what it's about. There's few resources for people who have missing loved ones and so it's a way to take some of those unsolved cases and try and, and figure out who they were and identify them.